Cray. We'll look forward to hearing all about that. If you'd like to ask them a question, the number to call 0345 6060 973, text 84850, and you can say, Alexa, send a comment to LBC. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, the family of Nicola Bully say their worst fears have been confirmed after police identified her body in a river in Lancashire. They've shared a statement which has been read by DCS Pauline Stables. She was the centre of our world who made our lives so special and nothing will cast a shadow over that. The mother of two had disappeared since walking her dog three weeks ago in St Michael's on wire. They've not given a cause of death. Another earthquake has struck the border between Turkey and Syria two weeks after a tremor killed at least 46,000 people. The 6.3 magnitude quake hit the Hatay province, which is still recovering from the disaster a fortnight ago. Devon and Cornwall Police insist it has made improvements to its gun licensing procedures following the deaths of five people in Plymouth. An inquest jury has found serious failings ahead of the shooting by Jake Davison in August 2021. Health Secretary Steve Barclay says he's deeply disappointed after junior doctors voted to go on strike. Members of the British Medical Association are planning to walk out for three days next month. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed up nine points at 80.14. The pound buys $1.20 and €1.12. LBC weather, some rain moving across northern and western Scotland, drier elsewhere with lows of five. Rain continuing in northern Scotland tomorrow, largely cloudy and dry elsewhere with highs of 12 Celsius. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Charlotte Morgan. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation, Cross Question, with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. It's one minute past eight. Welcome to Monday's Cross Question. I'm Ian Dale. With me in the studio, to my left, Baroness Patience Wheatcroft, non-affiliated peer, former editor of the Sunday Telegraph and the Wall Street Journal Europe. Tim Farron is Liberal Democrat MP for Westmoreland and Lonsdale and is, of course, former leader of the Liberal Democrats. To my right, it's Yasmin Alabai brown author and political commentator, and Duncan Baker, Conservative MP for North Norfolk. If you haven't phoned in yet and you'd like to, the number to call 0345 6060 973. You can text 84850 and you can send a comment via Alexa. Just say, uh, Alexa, send a comment to LBC. And don't forget, you can watch us as well on Global Player. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, welcome to you all. Let's go to our first questioner. It's Colin in Finchley. Hello, Colin. Good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. I'd like to ask, how are we going to afford to send aeroplanes over to Ukraine if we can't afford to put aeroplanes on the new Queen Elizabeth carrier? How can we send planes over there if we can't afford to put planes on the new carrier that is the most modernist carrier in the world? Well, I suppose the simple answer is a different type of planes. But but you are right that the US Marine Corps is currently supplying some of the F-35 jets which are stationed on the QE2 carrier because the RAF doesn't have enough of them at the moment, which is kind of humiliating, isn't it? Um, now, Liz Truss this evening has said that she thinks fighter jets should be sent to Ukraine, which is causing a bit of controversy because normally uh, former prime ministers, foreign secretaries don't intervene in the debate in this way. Let's go to Duncan Baker first. Now, Duncan, you've just come back for a few days in Ukraine. You drove there and back. What, what were you doing? Um, well, I was the first MP to bring a refugee family uh, to come and live with myself in North Norfolk. And so have been incredibly sort of uh, involved really with what has happened over the last year. And it was in November that I took my uh, refugee lady and her little boy uh, over to Ukraine to see their husband and father. And we took blankets and aid. And what we saw at that time was, you know, absolutely phenomenal, last of me forever. But the people of Ukraine, when we pulled out of the back of our van, in amongst the 300 blankets, we took uh, a generator. They stopped and they said, where did you get this from? And we said, uh, we got it donated by a local council in Norfolk. And they said, we cannot get them anywhere. 
can't get them in Poland, nowhere. Will you help us? And so we went back and uh, thought about it. And of course, we're going to help them. So we've just come back from donating 112 oh. generators, three vans in um, packed full of generators, took them to Lviv and uh, donated them to an aid agency to be put into the front line to help power orphanages, hospitals, soldiers who are fighting, community buildings. Uh, and I mean, the the gratitude and mm. the resilience of, of these people was just something, was quite remarkable, Ian. Well, well done you is all I can say. Mm. Uh, what, what a brilliant thing to do. It must have been a real experience as well, not, not just the drive there and, and back, but just sort of being in a war zone. I mean, it, was it dangerous at all where you were? Well, I, I did get a letter from um, the Foreign Office saying, we've heard what you're doing, we don't advise you doing it. Um, but you know yeah, a little bit. I've, I've had one of those before. Ignored that and carried on. <laughs> Mine was in um, Lebanon yeah. when the war was going on. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, listen, when you stand there at the border and you were looking into this inky blackness at night, total blackness because all the lights are out because of the air raids, um, yeah, I did text my wife and say, this is it, you know, um, hear from you again in the next few days. Uh, and it is pretty scary. But you get over the border um, and the telltale signs are tanks on the side of the road, blockades, young men and women with guns. Um, but when you get into the cities, I mean, we were in Lviv, which is on the most western mm. area, which we thought was pretty safe, uh, saying that there was still an air raid and the night that we were there and infrastructure was damaged. But people are trying to go about their normal lives. I mean, we went out to celebrate with the aid agency who were just so grateful, drinking in a bar in Lviv. And you just think, this is a country at war. Yeah. But the spirit is there that these people are going to win and we stand so shoulder to shoulder. Right, back to the back to Colin's question mm. then. That was really, really interesting though. Um, thanks for sharing the experience. Do you think we should be sending planes to Ukraine? Well, look, we, we have said we're going to train pilots. Why on earth would we go and train pilots if we're not going to end up giving them the hardware to be able to fly? I don't think we'll send necessarily our own uh, planes, but we'll end up using NATO jets. And it's not like you can go and train uh, a pilot to then go and fly a different type of aircraft. They will fly uh, NATO jets. But the bottom line is, do I think we should actually send them? I think there will be a time when we probably will, Ian. And the reason for that is that we will have to do absolutely everything we can to get a breakthrough. Otherwise, we will enter a, a long, protracted stalemate and we need to give the Ukrainians all the weapons they can possibly do to actually break that deadlock. And so I think you know, it's a simple question. Why on earth are we training people if we're not actually going to give them what they need? Yes, ma'am. Well, I don't know much about all the, the warfare stuff, but I, I do think if we want to see how exemplary we've been as a nation towards Ukraine, uh, uh, it's a really big moment when we did the right thing, we're doing the right thing. We're telling the right story about the refugees. I wish we could replicate that in other situations because we didn't do the right thing by Afghans. We really have failed them so much. So. In some ways, this has been a very important, optimistic moment in a very difficult, horrible war that they, it is possible for people to feel differently about refugees if we tell a different story. And for the population in this country to have done what it's doing, it's extraordinary. Makes me proud to be British. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> don't faint. Don't, can, don't, can we clip that, please, and put it out as a, as a, as a tweet? Uh, <laughs> patience. I think we should do everything we possibly can to help Ukraine. Like Yasmin, I've been proud of what we've done so far. And I think we are stronger helping them, working together. So as Duncan says, NATO will probably provide the jets. Mm. Other countries are doing what they can. And, and I think that that's the, the important thing, that Europe is united mm. to support Ukraine. and. Beyond that, I think it's probably wise for some former prime ministers, particularly those who are only in office for a very brief period of time, to perhaps keep out of the debate for a little while and not to tell the government or the country what to do. Tim Farron. Mm. Well, just to challenge Colin on his point about whether we can afford to do this, I think the easy response to that is we can't afford not to do this. The reality is that Ukraine is incredibly bravely, as uh, as uh, we've just heard, um, fighting for Western liberal democratic values on our behalf. Uh, and it's been the case for some time now, before 
uh, Russia invaded Crimea, that um, the case of those, of, we'll call them Western freedoms, those values that we take as being red and normal, are under very serious attack from not just Russia, but potentially from China, from uh, theocracies and dictatorships around the world. And uh, in Ukraine is where the battle has gone from cold to hot. And for us not to support Ukraine is not only morally wrong, if, if we were to choose to do that, um, but it would also be very foolish in terms of defending our own interests and the interests of the wider free world, to coin a phrase. So uh, we must uh, use every resource we have to back Ukraine, and I am likewise, um, to show unanimity, proud that we've done so, so far. Let's broaden this out a little bit. In the last hour, we were talking about defence spending, and the Chancellor is considering a request from the Defence Secretary at the moment for an extra £10 billion. Uh, we're being criticised by other European countries for not stepping up to the play, which I have to say I think is a bit of a cheat coming from one or two of them, but there we are. But the fact is that our defences have been largely hollowed out over the past 20 or 30 years yeah. and to say well let's put in another 10 billion i don't think would touch the sides we, we've got virtually no ammunition left we've only got 200 tanks 14 of which are going to ukraine our, our naval forces are depleted our army you could mm. fit inside Wembley stadium and you think well it's going to take a lot more than 10 billion pounds mm. to match that yeah. Well, no, the army is smaller now, the standing army is smaller now than any time in the last 200 years. And there has been steady attrition. Part of that was down to, I think, a level of complacency post the end of the Cold War. And steady, uh, it's been at the bottom of the of the pile of priorities for governments of all um, flavours and colours, including the one that I belong to. So I think that um, it's right that we reverse that. It is not about... Uh, aggression or nationalism it's about defending our way of life our values and being a team player in in the world that we have a military that is up to the job at the moment it isn't um duncan your constituents i know has a lot of ex-military but I'm, I'm sure you get your ear bent over the uh, over this all the time um wh where do you stand on extra defense spending because if you spend a, a considerable amount more the money's got to come from somewhere does it come from other departments budgets does it mean extra borrowing does it mean extra taxation well i suppose hindsight's a wonderful thing and yes we haven't spent enough on our military but that's then because we actually we probably haven't recognized just what an uncertain geopolitical world we are now living in and if we had thought to ourselves back in 2015 my goodness me in 2022 there's going to be this invasion by the russians into the ukrainians country uh, i suspect we would have uh, had an entire yeah, but we, we had the invasion of crimea, crimea in 2014 yeah. and course, it was eminently foreseeable yeah but we did not by, do anything by, about by the so-called experts you would yeah, have thought and we did not do anything about it and i I believe that was a mistake. Mm. So what we should have been doing is absolutely right. We should have been building up our forces and investing in our capabilities, but we didn't. Um, I agree entirely that we now should be doing that. I think it is entirely a bit cheeky for other European countries to criticise our spending when actually, other than the Americans, we have given more aid to the Ukrainians than any other nation on earth. But I would certainly agree that we now do absolutely need to reinvest in our forces. Yes. Can I ask a dissenting question? What would... An a larger this is your role on the program. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a peacemaker. This um, what is the role of a larger army in for the UK? Well, ask the Ukrainians that question. No, no, because are we going to send out? This is the question. The leap between having a large army or larger, better weaponry is that a bridge to actually being present in the war in Ukraine. Mm. I mean, I don't see the sense in it unless there is a, a way we're saying if we had a bigger army, it was very well equipped, we could send our boys and girls in there. Is that what we're talking about? I don't or think, are we just no. Well, I don't think we are, but Patience, what do you think? It's not what I'd be talking about, no. But I think we have to be, as a country, prepared to defend ourselves if the worst should happen. And at the moment, we are probably not. And that's a worrying position to be in. And Ben Wallace is just about agree that the country is so badly depleted in its armaments that we are vulnerable. And this is an uncertain world with all sorts of weird things going on. So I think it's right and indeed the duty of a government to try and be prepared to defend the country. Uh, and it's not just about defending this country, is it? It's meeting NATO obligations. I think yes, to be, yes. to be fair to the other European countries, that they are now questioning whether we would be able to do that. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. I, don't I think, think the NATO model I can completely go with. 
but but also the smarter you know we we need to be thinking about a much smarter response mm-hmm. to some of the situations that are now arising the traditional armies and weaponry may not i mean well that's what everyone thought until ukraine i mean yeah. the, the government to be yeah, fair yeah. have spent a huge amount of money on cyber defense mm-hmm. and cyber warfare yeah. um but maybe some of that money should have been diverted into more conventional I means i just say so you, ukraine's bravery um and uh, having not keeled over as the um, uh, the Russians expected a year ago has meant that Russia has not um, gone into NATO territory but if they had folded quickly as Putin expected I assume then we would have been called upon to provide troops in Lithuania Estonia and other places which yeah, are yeah. NATO allies we need to be able to meet those obligations also a vast amount of um, defence spending is about deterrence so that we don't need yeah. to fight, so that R- Russia and others rightly fear us and therefore don't make the first move. David Crediton sends a very um, troubling Alexa message saying this is a new Cuban missile crisis. Not quite sure I'd go that far, but you, you can see circumstances where it could be. That yeah. That's the problem, isn't it? That is the problem, and as Colin suggested, the, the root of the problem as well is that we simply don't mm. have much money. Mm. And yeah. if we're going to spend on defence, how are we going to pay for it? Do we cut back on other areas when we've got nurses who deserve more money? Mm. Where do we make the cuts? Or, as you suggested, do we borrow? And, and I think much as the idea of increasing borrowings is uncomfortable, there are some things that one has to borrow for. Not unfunded tax cuts, but defence. You've really got it in for Liz Truss, haven't you? <laughs> no, I've no, got it in for unfunded tax cuts. Can I pile in on that very briefly? Because I think that Cuban Missile Crisis, I hope it's not in the same territory, but I can see how it might be. And it is a reason, I'll say this very gently, why former Prime Ministers should be aware that careless talk can cost. Mm. Well, on that note, uh, we're going to move on to other questions, but first let's take a break. It's 16 minutes past eight. This is LBC.
Tim Farron, uh, Baroness Patience Wheatcroft, Yasmin Albay Brown, and Duncan Baker are with me on the panel uh, answering your questions. 0345 6060 Let's go to a text question from Gordon in Hampstead, who says Kate Forbes is one of the candidates to take over from Nicola Sturgeon. She's a member of the Free Church of Scotland and has expressed anti abortion, anti same sex marriage issues, uh, I think it means views, and has urged caution in gender recognition issues. Is her faith a political strength, a political weakness, or neither? Um, Tim Farron, I'm going to come to you first yeah. on this, because you, you've had sort of similar issues, haven't you, where your your views on some sort of conscience issues are maybe not quite the same as your party's. Yeah, I guess that is that is true. I think to answer the question, uh, we'll wait and see whether it's a strength or a weakness in a few weeks' time when the, the result comes out. I think that, I, I tend to think that, and I'm sure that Kate Forbes are a wiser and more capable person than me and will therefore deal with um, the scrutiny that maybe I got better than 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 I did. But I, th- I think that, you know, in, if we believe in diversity and we believe in defending the rights of people to um, be of different backgrounds, you're going to respect people's religious faith as well. One of the interesting things about the SNP contest is that I think there are three candidates declared and uh, one of p- perhaps Kate's most um, challenging opponent is Humza Yousaf, who's a, a Muslim. So I wonder whether that might mean that there's a slightly more intelligent discussion about the place of faith in politics and so I hope for both of them indeed all the candidates in that contest that if faith comes up and so it should it's relevant that it's discussed in a in a, in a decent and balanced way but is it possible if you, if you are leader of a political party or somebody who's leader of a country mm. in, in modern liberal inverted commas Britain to hold views that are socially conservative to the extent that I mean I don't know exactly what her views are on abortion but she's She's on the anti-side. She's clearly anti-same-sex marriage as well. Now, it may be that the SNP members are much more socially conservative than the the politicians, which I guess is possible possible in your party as as well. Um, But in 2023, can someone with those views be leader of a political party? It, It all depends on whether you think... If, let's say if you're a Christian, you think your role in politics is to legislate to make people who are not Christians live as though they were. And I fundamentally believe that is not our role. And uh, and so if you don't impose those values on others, then I think that is uh, that that I think that changes the dialogue completely. Having said all that, issues like abortion are for most parties a conscience matter. Mm. Um, and in any event, I can't imagine that if Kate Forbes was the first minister, she would be launching a plan to reverse or to change the abortion laws in in Scotland. So I think people should be a little bit relaxed about people's consciences. I think we'd rather have politicians who had a conscience and who felt there was some uh, plan behind everything and that their ambition wasn't simply about themselves and promoting themselves. And f- even people who lack a an established you know religious faith i think ought to be reassured that somebody who has those kind of uh, transcend, uh, transcendent values is somebody who might be more reliable than somebody who, who maybe doesn't say transgender then for a moment that, well, maybe that's next <laughs> <laughs> patience i think the overriding thing in our politicians is that they should be open and frank but support what what's most important to me, which is that they should be tolerant. And it's at the root of most religions, but not all, that there should be a degree of human kindness and understanding. And I think that the problem with some religious beliefs is that they want to do exactly what Tim said people shouldn't do and impose their religious beliefs on others. And I really do have a difficulty with that. So I think people are perfectly entitled to have religious beliefs of their own, but certainly not to impose them on others. And I think what's happening at the moment in the debate that I'm particularly interested in, which is that over a sister dying, Mm. that people are doing their best to block a sister dying for religious reasons, and they don't own up to the religious reasons. Mm. And, And that seems to me unfair. Nobody's asking them to order a sister dying or indeed to undergo it themselves just to let those who would like to to have the right and so i think tolerance yeah. and understanding is really what we need i know it's not my turn but may i push back a little bit on that um so i absolutely see where you're coming from on all that but i think to say that a world view we all have a world view nobody's empty-headed and neutral on any issue here um all of us have a world view to say that you can only 
contribute to debate, let's say on assisted dying, if you have no religious faith. Um, that's a nonsense. It's you know, not what we, I said. No, no, okay, but but the, but that some people are motivated by a worldview that they have, which is shaped by their religious faith. I think that's just as legitimate, no more nor less legitimate than somebody who comes at it from an atheistic. Okay, point. well, let's not divert onto that. Unless Sorry. somebody wants to phone in it's with really a question on assisted dying, we'd be happy to take that. Um, just just to throw this into the mix, Professor Adam Tompkins, a constitutional law expert at Glasgow University, also a former Conservative MSP, tweeted this morning that it is quote sickening that there is so much focus on Kate Forbes's Christian faith and none on Hamza Yousaf's Muslim faith. Mr. Yousaf tonight told. LBC's tonight with Andrew Marr that he's proud of his faith, but he doesn't use it as a basis of legislation. It, Yasmin, it does come to something when it's people. Are all, it's tantamount to saying that well, you can't be a leader if you're a Christian. No, you can be a leader if you're a Christian. And I don't agree with what I think Tim is saying, which one of the things that you, you, you I, I thought I heard you saying that you can only have a conscience if you have faith. No, I, I have faith. Yeah. I have faith, but my conscience isn't based on that faith. And I want in no way my faith to be part of the public space or public policy or politics. And and that's quite hard to achieve. So mm. if you are, say, somebody who's of this Christian faith and you are against abortion and there's an, a law going through and you have to put cast a vote, you... Where, how do you cast your vote without feeling you're betraying something you really believe? Um, well, Kate Forbes clearly has done that because she voted for the gender recognition bill and now she says so that she's I think not really it's in favour of it. But it is but that's a some compromise as a politician has to make. And I, the Muslim, did, the, the, you know, the, I'm sure with, with the, the Muslim it. candidate, it'll be the same thing. And there will be tremendous pressure. Duncan. Mm. Well there's going to be an enormous amount of scrutiny now over those candidates and particularly on their faith I suspect will be the uh, the contribution of uh, newspaper editors by enormous inches over the next few uh, weeks. It hasn't really figured in England has it? Uh, no, not to the same degree, but this is what will happen. It will now be absolute analysis of somebody's faith. For me, actually, it, it shouldn't be the determinant factor. The party membership will, will determine it uh, and we should be respectful, we should be tolerant. We are an incredibly tolerant um, society, certainly we no, are. No, no, not well, incredibly. We Sometimes are, we're we very intolerant, well, sorry. I actually hate this word tolerant, but, but overall, why, why should I be tolerated by anybody? I mean, it's actually a negative word, I think. Well, I think overall, in terms mm. of our society, in our country, we are a basis uh, versus and the great uh, many other nations. So, um, actually, we will see this now play out. And I hope that isn't the dominant factor of what uh, plays out who is, becomes the leader of the SNP. Their faith should not be the factor that mm. determines who becomes the leader. I agree with you on the word tolerance, by the way. Um, and we, we should be showing kindness and, and love for all people, you know, whether we agree with them or not. Where I think the word tolerance is useful is when it comes to competing worldviews. We might really not yeah. like what other people think we should tolerate them yeah and i think the where i think we've perhaps got wrong we we maybe assume slightly arrogantly that the modern dare i say it's sort of liberal conceptualization of what a democracy should look like that that's the only thing and everything beyond it is eccentric and we might just tolerate it i would argue that there is no neutrality in the public square uh, everybody has some kind of a faith even if it's a faith and there being nothing and it has a consequence on the decisions we make and the worldview we have so it, a good liberal democracy is a bit angular a bit edgy a bit difficult where we do tolerate one another and fight for each other's rights well, when you decide to stand for the leadership of the Lib Dems, how much did you think about these kind of issues and thought, well... Not enough. <laughs> I mean, did you have people, like good yeah. friends, saying to you, are you mad? Why, why are you doing this? You know that this is going to yeah, be an issue you're a you. weird god-botherer and people yeah. come after you. Yeah, so, I mean, I think to an extent, maybe I got so busy um, that I was slightly out of uh, fellowship with my church, didn't spend time talking to people, going over these issues. Also, the Christians around me wonderful, wonderful people, but not particularly politically active. So he had this sort of... So if I was to advise a person running for leadership now who is a Christian, I'd say make sure you are constantly um, in good fellowship with other Christians, but also other Christians who get politics, and understand the compromises, understand the issues, um, and I'd have done it better, and hopefully... Because it, it comes well. to something in, a, in what's supposed to be a Christian country when it's a disadvantage for you to be a Christian standing for the leadership of a political party. I mean, 
that might be a peculiarly British thing. I mean, I um, had a chat with Michael Weir, who was Barack Obama's faith advisor, who's one of these weird uh, white evangelical Democrats, amazing, um, uh, the other week. And we, you know, comparing notes in the States, you've got to pretend you've got a faith uh, to be electable. In the UK, you've got to pretend that you haven't. I think that's, mm. that's exaggerated, and I don't think it's as bad as that here. I think we actually are more tolerant than many other countries when it comes to these sorts of things, yeah. and it just takes wiser people than me to stand for leadership. Uh, and wiser people than me to make assertions about Kate Forbes, which turned out to be fundamentally untrue, because Kate Forbes did not vote on the GRR bill because she was on maternity leave. She said tonight that she would have voted against it had she been working at the time, which I guess is slightly convenient, because she would have had to resign like her <laughs> other fellow candidate, Ash Regan, did. Um, to vote against that bill. So apologies God for... God moves in mysterious ways. Well, in, indeed, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> she is the anointed one, clearly. Right, we'll move on to other questions in just a moment. If you would like to phone in and get more from patients on assisted dying and the rest of the panel, you're very welcome to do so, or indeed on anything else. It's half past eight. Let's get the latest news headlines on LBC from Charlotte Morgan. The family of Nicola Bully say their worst fears have been confirmed after police identified her body in a river in Lancashire. The mother of two had disappeared since walking her dog three weeks ago in St Michael's on wire. They've not given a cause of death. Another earthquake has struck the border between Turkey and Syria two weeks after a tremor killed at least 46,000 people. The 6.3 magnitude quake hit the Hatay province, which is still recovering from the disaster a fortnight ago. Health Secretary Steve Barclay says he's deeply disappointed after junior doctors voted to go on strike. Members of the British Medical Association are planning 72 hours of industrial action next month. LBC weather, some rain moving across northern and western Scotland tonight. Drier elsewhere with a low of 5 Celsius. This is LBC.
It's 8.34, cross question with Tim Farron, Baroness Patience Wheatcroft. And for all of those who say, I shouldn't say Baroness Patience Wheatcroft, it's Baroness Wheatcroft. It's kind of all, you, you kind of have to give a first name as well now, don't you? You can Is drop acceptable? the Baroness. OK, I'll drop the Baroness. Patience. Or, or Pat, as she's known to her friend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you should have seen that face. <laughs> and Yasmin Alibi Brown and Duncan Baker, Conservative MP for North Norfolk. Right, Rose is in Bristol. Hello, Rose. Hello. Yeah, Hi, I what would you heard, like to ask? Yeah, I just heard uh, the news on Radio 4 and uh, Nicola Bully's family are uh, asking for the media to leave them alone, quote. What I don't understand is there are laws in this country um, against harassment and stalking. Mm. I've actually been helped by the law of harassment, and it's helped me. So I don't understand why the laws in this country against harassment and stalking don't apply to the media. And this is the same thing that Harry and Meghan were complaining about. How is it that the media are allowed to bang on people's doors, phone them, not leave them alone, chase them up the street when they go to the shop. Why don't these laws of the land of against harassment and stalking apply to the media? Okay. I don't understand well, the, it. Well, the family statement accused journalists of misquoting and vilifying Miss Bully's partner, Paul Ansell, um, other members of the family and their friends, and I think they highlighted ITV News and Sky News. Um, for having contacted them last night when they specifically asked to be left alone. Um, Patience, you were a newspaper editor, not of a tabloid, it has to be said. How do you respond to Rose's question? I think she's absolutely right. There's no excuse for the media harassing and stalking. And if a family have specifically asked to be left alone, the day that the body of their loved one is found, it's appalling for the media to go and knock on the door, uh, unforgivable. And I think it's also a breach of the editorial code. And so they should be hauled up in front of the authorities. And uh, Does it count as harassment, though? That's Rose's accusation here. Well, I think it probably yeah. does. Um, and it's certainly not what should be done and not what reputable media organisations should be doing. I find this whole case quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. The media interest in it, um, the coverage of it, the, the social media interest in it, and the police behaviour. I mean, every aspect of it is extraordinary. But there's no situation that I can think of where the media should go where they've specifically been asked not to by a grieving family. Mm -hmm. Yasmin? I totally agree with every word Patience has said, but there's also... It's, it's complicated. Several other women and others went missing over this period. And one of the questions I cannot understand or answer is, why does one case ignite? And Madeleine McCann is a good exactly. example here. And so I've had, you know, communication from families where their people have gone missing, saying, why is the media not interested in us? Yeah. Which is why I'm saying it's quite complicated, because the initial interest in Nicola, a bully, did do some good. It made people aware, they started helping, all of that. And and then the media acts, uh, like, you know, like, I don't know, flesh-eating monsters, really. Um, but there is some w good that comes out of initial but media interest. It's when you say the media, obviously the media is, is a big beast. Yeah. I mean, it contains broadsheet newspapers, tabloid newspapers, news channels, and here the family is specifically attacking two news organisations. They're not attacking the Sun or the Mirror, they're attacking reputable news organisations. And that's what I mean, that it becomes so monstrous after a certain point. And we do forget, I mean, I'm a, I've been a journalist 37 years now, we can forget the human beings mm. um, that we are following, writing about. So I completely understand the the, the, the lady who's asked the question, but I also know that uh, people feel so utterly let down when there's no interest um, in, in uh, missing people. Like there's a young black woman who has been missing in over that the same period. Nobody's run a single thing about her. So it's, I find it, maybe we win, we, we lose and we win, whatever we do. Duncan Baker, there, there is a, 
a balance to strike here. We did a phone in last week on the police sort of operation. And I remember saying to Corey, my producer, at the end of the hour, I said, I found that profoundly uncomfortable hour to, to host because you're constantly walking a tightrope because you don't want to say anything that is, is inappropriate or wrong that would upset the family. But in a sense, if you, if you do an hour on something, you, you're not going to get it right all, all the time. Now, I, d I think we did do it in a responsible way, but I can understand why the family would think that certain parts of the media haven't covered this responsibly. Uh, 100%. This, at the end of the day, this is a, a family, a husband left with two little children who has lost mm. his wife. And the circus that has been created by some media organisations has been absolutely appalling. But it's not just that, Ian. It's also the role of how social media has been oh, in yeah. this as well. I mean, it has been absolutely you know, Amateur detectives yeah. turning up en masse to try and engage with what's going on, filming themselves digging on the bank, you know, um, on TikTok and posting videos that go viral. How on earth has that family coped through what has been the most intense scrutiny? People just inventing stories and conspiracies about a man's wife who has passed away, thinking that they know better than the professionals who are investigating and trying to build a case around trying to find that lady. Um, I don't know how that family has coped with it, but I think it really does make us look at our society and how some people behave. And I think it's wholly wrong what's happened to that family. Uh, it makes you lose faith in human nature a bit when you see some yeah, of does. the disgraceful things mm. that people did. By the way, Yasmin, uh, good news. The 13-year-old that you referred to there who went missing in Southwark has now been found safe and well, but she'd been missing for more than a week and a half. And uh, I think the police always say, if, if, you're, not, if, you don't, if, if you're not found within yeah. the first, is it six hours or ten hours or something like that, that is when you start to worry. But she has been found oh, safe and well. Tim Farron. Mm. And we didn't hear very much about that, which no. makes Yasmin's point very, very clearly. I can think of people I know um, with loved ones who have been missing for a long time, in one case who sadly passed away not long ago, and there was nothing like the kind of scrutiny and um, media interest that there has been in this particular case. So in some cases you would like there to be more coverage, and in this case... I mean, it's utterly, utterly heartbreaking that we now know just in the last hour or two that uh, Nicola has uh, has died. And um, as Duncan says, our, the, the main thing has got to be focusing on supporting that family, which I think by and large means getting out of their hair completely. Um, and, you know, uh, those of us who pray to pray for them but to not get involved uh, because people need to be able to grieve. And I, I've, I've thought... That, I mean, you talk about social media, we also have 24-hour media, and sometimes people have to invent things to talk about to keep these things in the news. I saw the awful stuff the other day. I can't remember which, which outlet it was. Uh, derogatory comments on what the chief inspector was wearing. Oh, uh, God, you know, yes. Outrageous. So I think... I, I felt throughout all this and um, so not all but I think so you just much promoted of the media her actually have i was she detective yeah. inspector detective superintendent I, or is that below inspector i, I don't know sure. but anyway a a, a senior ish at least police officer yes. and there was no scrutiny of the work she was doing or exposing the uh, what frock. we needed mm. the frock she was wearing mm. um and and i, I thought it was utterly outrageous and ignore the sexism. If to, we be, to, be, sexism. to be fair, I think there was legitimate criticism of her for essentially giving public or or what was it she said that the that Nicola was um, had vulnerabilities and of course the natural reaction is say well what are they? Oh, okay. She said well I'm not going to say and then three hours later she did. They did. Yeah. I think that's a legitimate area for criticism. Indeed, but not what she was wearing. No, yeah. and I think Absolutely. that tells you an awful lot about the the kind of nature of the cover. Right. So it's heartbreaking and I think it's been pretty ugly as well. Rose, thank you very much for that. Let's squeeze in another question um, before the break. James is in Hitchin. Hello, James. Oh, good evening. Um, has the panel recovered yet from the childhood trauma of reading Roald Dahl novels? <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't, yes, find, I don't find it funny or object... You know, I, I'm sorry, I go... I take the other side because I... You know, the, the, it's, it's, it's so easy to mock or to go into a defensive mode. And actually, let me tell you, Roald Dahl himself... You might not know this. In 1971... You've done your homework. I've done my homework. The Oompa Loompas, for example, were in 
previously from the very deepest and darkest part of African, of the African jungle, where no white man had ever been before. And they were brought over so that, you know, they could live in a, what was it? I can't remember what word to use. He changed it. He changed it in 1974. He changed it after people argued with him, in particular a, 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 a children's writer called Eleanor Cameron. And he turned those characters into long-haired, rosy-cheeked white people. So don't tell me the written word is sacrosanct. Things in it blighten was the ha, same. Have we got to a point where we can't use the word fat in case it offends somebody because no, that, it, that has apparently changed children. it enormously. Look, now. I go a lot into playgrounds, my neighbouring, you know, where I live, often because I'm writing about bullying and what. But what's interesting, in children's play, playgrounds, the vocabulary changes. Um, so there was a time when asylum seeker became the swear word. But fat is a word that they use cruelly. Children can be really cruel. What well, children have done for centuries. Yeah, but we are now also, no, we are now living at, in times where nine-year-olds have look at themselves in, in the mirror and hate their bodies. Mm -hmm. These are very different times. So we have to understand the context. And I think instead of mocking and rejecting the thing, Enid Blyton, I loved Enid Blyton. Right? Magic then, faraway tree, can't so beat it. Then one day in school, I read this. But big ears, I mean, you can't possibly call him big no, ears. Anymore. Listen, this was in my class. Yeah, I mean, this was in my do? class in primary school. And I really got upset. The face has nasty gleaming eyes and it looked very dark. Perhaps it was a black man's face. And I, I got very, very upset and argued with my class, uh, with my teacher. Mm. Um, and these things impact on black children, on uh, overweight children. What's wrong with trying to make it all a bit kinder? Okay, Tim. Mm. Um, so I don't agree with tipexing out things that um, uh, authors have, have written. Uh, if we don't like what he's written, don't buy or read his works. I do, however, quite, have quite a bit of sympathy with what Yasmin says. I, I, the generation I'm uh, part of were, you know, I guess at the forefront of political correctness, and I still stand by it. The, what, what is political correctness about? It's about using language that's kind, um, and we should use language that's kind, and we shouldn't be beating each other the head saying, oh, you're being woke, if you choose to use language that other people are comfortable with hearing. That's just basic politeness. I do, however, think that particularly, I mean, y yes, some of the, the language that Roald Dahl uses is stuff that wouldn't necessarily be used regularly today. I just think there's something off and a little bit Orwellian about tipexing out stuff. So you're basically sitting on the that. fence trying no, to No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm tolerating Roald Dahl. I'm I'm saying you want to cancel him, don't buy his stuff, don't change what's in his books. But, no, uh, I think we should I mean, change the, it. Because I, what you said about Enid Blyton, though, I think is really interesting because, I mean, I remember, re, I mean, Enid Blyton was my author mm. of choice as a child. Mine too. But when I when I think about some of the phrases that were used in those books now, they, they would not be acceptable. No. And, and in 1971, there was a big conversation in the nation about it. And loads of things were changed in those books. So it's not now. You know, this idea that it, we've gone mad. Did you read The Secret of Spiggy Holes? No. Not that you should have done. <laughs> Patience. <laughs> I think that the author should have the last word on what gets published under their name. But if they're dead? If they're dead, that's the last word. Um, it's not up to any of us to go along and re rewrite their work and publish it under their name. So if Roald Dahl wanted to change his, his copy, as he did, Yasmin tells us, that's fine. That's his right. But it's not my right or yours to change what's in it. I actually read the Roald Dahl books to my children, and I don't think they're particularly scarred. But then, like many of us, I grew up with the, the Grimm's fairy tales, and <laughs> yes, they're pretty grim. They are. <laughs> Duncan? Um, well, I'll let you into a little secret. This week, uh, my children and, and little Ukrainian uh, lads, I take my wife whilst uh, we were in Ukraine, bought him a copy of The Twits. And uh, he can read brilliantly well, given that, uh, that English is uh, only a language he's learned for the last um, few months. 
howling with laughter at reading the twits. I've um, no idea what the twits is. Oh, the twits is about um, a, a male and a female married who are absolutely really evil, horrible, horrible, horrible you know. people. Mr. Twit has a beard. He keeps his old bits of food in it and eats it later on. I'm not scared. Obviously a Liberal Democrat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a beard in. I'm still reading the twits and I'm not offended. You have, well, you've got a little bit of a beard. Yeah, you're it's not, not about beard. offense. It's not, not long last week. Can you just say, it's not about offense. It's not about wokery. It's about children and their world in our times and being kind and taking care of them. It's very, very different from adult novels. I would defend adult novels. Sure, totally. but there's a context, isn't it? And children yeah, sure. really are not that naive that they can't no, actually but understand they, the context. Okay, of we've gone something. over time. Very interesting discussion there. It's 8.49. Mm. LBC. Eight fifty-two. Tim Farron, Patience Wheatcroft, Yasmin Alibi Brown, and Duncan Baker with me answering your questions. Well, I did ask you for a question <laughs> on assisted dying, and as if by magic, uh, one's coming from Jonathan in Barnes, who says, "Would assisted dying ever be truly acceptable in this Christian country of ours?" Well, there's a theme in the programme tonight, isn't there? Mm -hmm. um, Patience, the floor is yours. Yes, I think it will be. Uh, there are other Christian countries, such as the United States, where it's already acceptable. Um, so I don't think in the end that we will be able to go on without giving people the option, only an option, if they are terminally ill, of being able to say that they would like to opt out sooner rather than later. So, yes, I think it's the Christian thing to do myself. Duncan? It's a really interesting question. There was a great thought that when uh, the new intake of the 2019 uh, MPs came in, they were much younger, uh, big Conservative majority, there was going to be a real chance to actually get legislation through for assisted dying. But that really hasn't happened. I know, obviously, we've had a pandemic in the middle. Um, 
I used to think I was absolutely nailed on to agree that there was a case that we could go down this route of assisted dying. I watched the documentary that was on at the last week between uh, Danny Krug, one of my colleagues, and Prue Leith, and his mother. His mother. And they are diametrically opposed to each other's view. Prue Leith, very, very uh, uh, supportive of it, and Danny, not so. Uh, what it does do is it, I urge everybody to watch it because it really does bring out some of the more detailed, difficult decisions to make. And there are indeed some countries, uh, certainly the Scandinavian countries, that introduced it and now certainly regret introducing it. So whereas overall I think I am in favour of it, certainly you know, cases like people who are suffering from MND, etc., um, there's a real viable case for it. But I think we have to be very, very careful to get the legislation right because the uh, other countries that have done it sometimes haven't got it all right. I think it's a far more nuanced and difficult uh, issue to get right than people perhaps initially think. Yes, ma'am. I think in a, a country where, where we've had abortion rights, we have to have the right to die. As long as safeguards in, are in place. Mm. The idea that my life, and actually to describe this country as a Christian country, whatever that means, when actually fewer and fewer people are practicing Christians, we're a multi-dimensional multi-faith country and all religions will have their objections but in the end if we have accepted abortion as a right i can't see why you would insist cruelly to keep people alive who are really suffering and want to go yeah. i don't understand it tim is there an argument here about population growth as well, that at some point in the next 100, 200 years, I mean, the world's population is going to be too much to for the planet to cope with, and therefore um, I, I suspect assisted dying will go way beyond just people who are terminally ill. Wow, so we're talking about proper euthanasia in well, that case. I, I've <laughs> wow. tried to choose my words carefully. <laughs> but. But that's, yeah, so, I mean, first of all, all that sounds utterly dystopian and secondly I think all the evidence is if you want to get on top of population growth you improve people's living quality and their health care because they have fewer children that's what's happened if you look across the the world the growth is in the areas which are the poorest I think on the issue first of all I mean I take a position where I would vote against assisted dying in parliament for lots of reasons but I totally understand and sympathize the other side with the other side of the argument I'm, I'm sure it is mostly born out of a desire to be compassionate also, um, as Yasmin has alluded to, this is a, people will say this is about rights and my, my choice over my life. So I absolutely hear that. Um, insofar as my Christianity impacts my opinion on this, it's about my fundamental belief in the equal dignity of every single human being at a very lofty level. And the thing is, I'm all for, even if I don't like them, uh, people having rights to make choices that are totally self-regarding. The difficulty with this is I'm not convinced it's totally self-regarding because what it does, it creates a, uh, a kind of acceptance within society that there is a point beyond which people are useful. Um, it, uh, evidence tends to suggest that where it's put into practice, in some cases at least, we have seen people effectively shuffled off more quickly than they should be because family want the money and all the rest of it. You also see reduction in investment in palliative care. We stop thinking about how people can live longer well and die well, but thinking, well, OK, you've had your time, it's time to go now. And so the impact of one individual making a choice over their lives then has an impact on how society thinks about life and death. And that gets the heart of what it is to be a human being. And that's why I am more than sceptical on the but, issue. But Tim, yep. you're denying people. My mother wanted to die. And there was no... She kept saying, mm. I just want to die. I've been in the same and, situation. And she starved herself, which was the most horrible thing to watch. It took months, yeah. but she just starved herself to death. So which was better? So, we, I, I, well, I've also dealt with similar situations within my own family, which is why I don't dismiss your point of view you know, without any consideration whatsoever. I then ask myself, what does it mean to live in a country where we choose to voluntarily end people's lives before their time? Surely the investment in uh, in living well, in dying well, in she palliative care, in we, palliative we, I care, I took care of her. She was means that we keep until she wanted to die. Sure, um, th okay. there, there are. Complex arguments, but in the, in the end, I think we have to recognise that the consequences of a person's choice to do that 
has massive implications for the we society. We are near we, the end of the programme, and I want white. to cheer ourselves up with our fun question at the end from Sam and Golders Green, who says, the BAFTAs are, of course, each year a chance for us to see a load of entitled people talking about how great they are. I watched with keen interest. Could your panel tell me, if they were accepting an award, which famous person they would thank first? Now, Yasmin, you must have won lots of awards in your time. Ian Dale. Correct answer, Duncan Baker. Oh, probably Ian Dale. Oh, no, 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 yeah. Well, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> uh, Tim Farron, Patience Wheatcroft, Jasmine Alibar Brown, and Duncan Baker, thank you very much indeed for joining us on Cross Question. We'll have another one for you tomorrow. Now, the most dangerous domestic abusers will be put on the Violent and Sex Offenders Register, according to the Home Secretary. A proposed law change will see them monitored more closely by the police, prison and probation services so they, quotes, do not fall through the cracks. Such offenders also face being electronically tagged under measures being piloted in three UK areas. Do you think this will actually act as a bit of a deterrent to those who commit domestic abuse? I want to hear your experiences of domestic abuse over the next hour because it's another one of those subjects that possibly we don't talk about often enough. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock, Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer says the discovery of Nicola Bully's body in Lancashire is devastating. Police have made a formal identification.